Hey there, fellow travelers. Welcome to the Tolkien Road, episode 254. Greta, what's up? Hey, hey. Uh, not a whole lot. What's up with you? Not too much. Wow. Just trying to but stay cool here. We got an exciting episode. Yeah. So you want to jump to it? Let's do it. Why did Numenor exist? Was it simply to reward the Adain and their descendants, or was there some greater purpose that impacted the rest of Arda and perhaps even the cosmos? On this episode, we're exploring the religion of Numenor in order to better understand the purpose for Numenor's existence. Okay. So Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Before we get started, we'd like to give a double up air five to our patrons. Special thanks to this episode's executive producers, Andrew T., John R., and Ms. Anonymous. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Uh, shout out to our newest patron, Ed P., Thank you, Ed. Yes, thanks, Ed. And shout out to a couple of patrons that boosted their pledges, Sir Warty Windwalker and Ty M. Awesome. Thank you all both. Yes, thank you. So much. Please support the Tolkien Road by visiting patreon.com slash Tolkien Road. Becoming a patron lets you support the show in a tangible way and lends you some awesome perks. And don't forget, you can now make an annual pledge and get one month free. Also subscribe. Well, wait, wait, wait. Yeah, one sorry. of those perks. There's our double layer five. Did we do it? Oh, darn it. I, yeah, I ran right through it. Let's do it. do it. Okay, here Let's we go. You guys ready? Three, two, one. You rock patrons? Absolutely. Um, also, subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes and other podcasting platforms. If you are a five-star fan of The Tolkien Road, you can really help us out by heading over to iTunes or your preferred source for the show and dropping us a rating and review. When you do that, it helps get the word out about the Tolkien Road, which helps us to keep on evering on. Evering on. And it's time for the weekly Tolkien Road Air 5 for all of those watching us on YouTube. All right, here Let's we go. Do it. Three, two, one. Whoops. Boom. Nice. That was a pretty good one. That was a good one. Hey, while you're over on YouTube watching us, make sure and subscribe and click the notify bell for our channel. So yeah. We're Getting, uh, getting closer to that goal we have of getting a thousand subscribers over there. And once we've got a thousand subscribers over there, uh, we're going to be able to do, you know, uh, a lot of cool stuff over there. So we're really looking forward to that. So, you know, help us out. Even if you don't normally listen over there, we got videos that are only over there. Um, so if you're a podcast listener, but you want more of us, you can head on over to YouTube and uh, you can find uh, more from us over on YouTube. So that's not necessarily on the podcast feed. So mm -hmm. make sure and check that out. Yeah. All right. Like I said, in this episode, we are focusing on the religion of Numenor. This is a very important topic for a number of reasons, but I want to highlight two specifically. First of all, Tolkien famously, and as it turns out controversially, called Lord of the Rings a fundamentally religious and Catholic work. What exactly he meant by this is a subject of much ongoing debate and likely key to understanding what he meant to do with the work. Mm. So when you say something is fundamentally a thing, that means pay attention to what's going on there, That's right? right? Like pay attention to what is underlying all of this. Second of all, religion is, a, religion is a subject that has been of foundational importance in every human civilization in recorded history. Religion informs how we see ourselves and the meaning of our lives. Therefore, to know that Numenor had an actual religion is key to understanding what Numenor was all about. Indeed, there may be no more important topic for the producers of Lord of, Lord of the Rings on Prime, of Latron Prime, to think about and incorporate into the show if they want to make it truly worthy of Tolkien's name. That's a fair point. So I think you guys mm -hmm. have heard me say more than once, I really hope they pay attention to this and they don't mm -hmm. just like shuffle it off to the side, yep. right? Yeah. I am convinced after doing the research for this episode that to get the religion of Numenor correct and to understand what was going on is to get the purpose of Numenor right, okay, is, is to really understand why Numenor was there in the first place. So that's what we're going to be diving into as we explore the religion of Numenor. Mm. So at first, it would seem that Tolkien didn't have a lot to say on this subject. And really, in the grand scheme of things of everything he said, it's not a lot we have to go off of. I'll, I'll be the first to admit that. But let's let's go, let's just take a close look at what he actually said. All right. So we're going to be looking at uh, unfinished tales. And this is the chapter, the description of Numenor. This is actually a part of the, of that, of that chapter. We've actually, we've actually uh, talked about that whole chapter before we did an episode a while back on, um, on this, this chapter, the description of the Island of Numenor. Um, so I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs that pertain to this. All right. 
The land of Numenor resembled an outline of five pointed star or pentangle with a central portion some 250 miles across north and south and east and west from which extended five large peninsular promontories. These promontories were regarded as separate regions and they were named Forastar, Andustar, Hyarnistar, Hyarostar, and Orastar. The central portion was called Mitalmar, and it had no coast except the land about Romana and the head of its firth. A small part of the Mitalmar was, however, separated from the rest and called Arandor, the king's land. In Arandor were the haven of Romana, the Menaltarma, and Armenelos, the city of the kings, and it was at all times the most populous region of Numenor. The Mitalmar was raised above the promontories, not reckoning the height of their mountains and hills. It was a region of grasslands and low downs, and few trees grew there. Near to the center of the Middlemar stood the tall mountain called Middletarma, pillar of the heavens, sacred to the worship of, of Eru Iluvatar. Though the lower slopes of the mountain were gentle and grass covered, it grew ever steeper, and towards the summit it could not be scaled. But a winding spiral road was made upon it, beginning at its foot upon the south and ending below the lip of the summit upon the north. For the summit was somewhat flattened and depressed and could contain a great multitude, but it remained untouched by hands throughout the history of Numenor. No building, no raised altar, not even a pile of undressed stones even stood there. And no other likeness of a temple did the Numenorians possess in all the days of their grace until the coming of Sauron. There no tool or weapon had ever been born, and there none might, um, there none might speak any word save the king only. Thrice only, only in each year the king spoke, offering prayer for the coming year at the Eru Kierme in the first days of spring, praise of Eru Iluvatar at the Eru Laitale in midsummer, and thanksgiving to him at the Eru Hantale at the end of autumn. At these times the king ascended the mountain on foot, followed by a great concourse of the people, clad in white and garlanded, but silent. At other times the people were free to climb to the summit alone or in company. But it is said that the silence was so great that even a stranger ignorant of Numenor and all its history, if he were transported thither, could not have dared to speak aloud. No bird ever came there, save only eagles. If anyone approached the summit, at once three eagles would appear and alight upon three rocks near the western edge. But at the times of the three prayers, they did not descend, remaining in the sky and hovering above the people. They were called the Witnesses of Manwe. And they were believed to be sent by him from Amman to keep watch upon the holy mountains and upon all the land. So <clears throat> there you go. It, that's that's about all that Tolkien, it, uh, in, in terms of published material, that's about all he had to say about this religion. But it's actually a good bit, and I want to dive into it because I think once we understand that passage and then kind of synthesize it with other things we know about Middle Earth, it tells us a lot about Numenor and why Numen Numenor was there in the first place. So let's look at some of these things. So Numenor, um, Numenor was this land of gift. In fact, one of its names had to do with that very idea, right? That it was the, it was the land of gift. Um, it was as close to earthly paradise as men were permitted to approach a land to be enlightened by the blessed realm. So it's situated halfway really between uh, middle earth and halfway between and um, and have in Amman. Mm -hmm. So, um, it's also a star shaped land, right? Star would seem to have something to do with the heavens, right? The, yeah. the sky, right? So it was deliberately star shaped. It was raised out of, out of the ocean and it was star shaped. It, so that seems to indicate this like heavenly destiny that it's not of this world. And then we have in the middle of it, the very center of it at the heart of Numenor is the mental Tarma, right? The pillar of the heavens. Again, all of this does not seem to be this thing where it was, you know, constructed by the Numenor, the, by the Numenorians. There was something they came up with. This was all gifted to them. It was a grace yeah. given to them. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Um, so, it was not the work of, of mortal hands. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, in fact, we see that, that they weren't to have anything that was the work of their own hands upon the mental Tarma. Mm -hmm. Right. There was, we know that they were an incredible culture. We know that they had uh, magnificent cities. Um, they were magnificent mariners later in their history. Shipbuilders. Shipbuilders, right. Mm -hmm. um, but they were not to even construct like a basic altar on top of the mountain, right? It was just, they were to go up there themselves three times a year and offer these prayers, yeah. right? It's almost this pilgrimage. Um, 
so uh, Akalabeth does also mention the mental tarma as being hallowed to Iluvatar, yeah. right? So we know that this was that this was most certainly a thing that they were uh, that it's not just that like this didn't get left out. Um, uh, it, it it's not like Tolkien like excised this later on, right? We have no indication that this was not something that he wanted for the story of uh, Numenor, yeah. right? Everything is that everything indicates that this was actually something that he would have wanted, right? Right. right. All right, so the three prayers. Um, the first one is the Erukierme, uh, uh, spring prayer, supplication for blessing upon the year. So this was a prayer. To, so this means prayer to Eru and Quenya, right? So, you know, this is a form of supplicatory prayer. We're asking for your blessing upon this coming year, right, to Eru. The second prayer was the er, Eru Laitale, uh, praise of Eru, is what that means in Quenya. So they're offering, it's, it's not just asking for something, but it's, it's ascribing praise. It's, 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 it's a more like direct act of worship, right? Um, you know, giving thanks, um, uh, not even giving thanks, but just ascribing greatness to, uh, to Eru, to one to who it's proper, right? Mm -hmm. And then the Eru Hantale is the Thanksgiving at the end of autumn. So uh, Thanksgiving for the year past to Eru, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, and again, we don't know, like, we don't have any reason to think that this was, um, like we, we don't know where this came from, right? All we know is that it seems to have been part of their culture from very early on, right? It doesn't seem like it's something they made up necessarily, but it's something that uh, was given to them or even like revealed to them. Mm. Uh, we also see this bit about eagles being present, the three yeah. eagles, right? Yeah, I thought that was so, interesting. Manway's witnesses, right? Um, that that these are here, but they're witnesses to the Numenorians' um, worship of Iluvatar. Right. Mm -hmm. Again, so this, you know, this, you know, a while back we did this episode on Lord of the Rings and paganism and this whole question of like, since there were all these gods, you know, in, uh, in Middle Earth on Arda, does that mean that this was like a pagan culture? And, and what we really realized is that no, um, Eru was the ascendant one who created all these other gods, right? Mm -hmm. He was the one that was uncreated, right? And this idea is very much in keeping with like Christian theology, right? So you know, just basic Christian theology that God is the, the God we worship is uncreated. Okay. Um, what's really interesting in, in so much of this is that the people of Numenor were a people particularly hallowed to Iluvatar, the Supreme God, right? So we'd have no indication that um, the elves had this kind of relationship with Iluvatar. Right, not that they weren't his children because they clearly were. They they were one of the two kindreds, the children of Iluvatar. But you know, we don't see them. They, they have a much closer relationship, it would seem, to the Valar. Right? Yeah. Um, they they spend countless years in uh, in Amon mm -hmm. um, in the time of the two trees, and they seem to have this relationship with the Valar. And even there, it seems like every every like kind of interaction they may want to have with Iluvatar would actually go through Manwe, right? Mm -hmm. So Manwe is almost like, for the elves, is almost like their, their high priest, if you will. Yeah, right? their ambassador. Yeah. yeah. But here we have Numenor communicating directly, as it were, right? And their, their religion is focused directly on Iluvatar, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there, is, there, there mm -hmm. seems to be no, no intermediary with that, right? It's just a direct, it's a direct connection. Hmm. Um, second of all, when Sauron corrupts Numenor, he makes a special point to corrupt, to corrupt their religion, erecting a temple and persecuting the faithful. Mm -hmm. So we know that um, the religion is important because the religion in Akalabeth, this religion is corrupted specifically by Sauron, right? Right. That's what, that was his target. Right. Yeah. He creates a temple. He builds a temple when there, before there was not one, mm -hmm. right? And, and then he proceeds to persecute the faithful whom we think of as being like faithful to kind of the traditions, but I would assume that this is one of the traditions that they were faithful to, right? That they had respect, that the faithful had respect for the Valar, but also for the religion because, because they, because the other Numenorians depart from that religion. Right. Mm. So that's one of the marks that makes them the faithful is that we, I would assume that they are there. They want to be faithful to the religion of Numenor. Right. And just the fact that Sauron built, builds a temple that's going against that initial, that, you know, initial uh, law or whatever, that they're not supposed to build anything with their own hands on there, right? So right. that's like a direct contradiction of that very 
clear mandate. Right, exactly. Um, and and the, the kind of the third thing I want to highlight about this passage is we don't know anything about where this religion came from. It appears mm-hmm. to have been part of the deal from the very beginning, perhaps something revealed to them. Um, and a Calabath begins by saying that men came into the world under the shadow of Morgoth and that they feared the darkness and worshiped it. I was actually doing some research in the history of Middle Earth series in one of the volumes. And I mean, um, there, it, there are some fascinating things that, that go into that idea more of like where men came from in the whole, in the whole scheme and, and the fall of, and the fall of men too. Right. Mm. Um, Tolkien actually did write out a, a good bit about what happened there and how Melkor um, corrupted them and what he did. Right. And it, and it kind of matches the pattern of what Sauron does to Numenor, like later in their history. Right. Um, so um, on all of this, it would seem that Numenor was given this religion to begin the process of enlightening men to the true nature of Iluvatar and to their destiny as his people. And I think this is where the idea of the ban becomes really interesting, right? So mm-hmm. the ban is this idea that, the, that men were not to enter into Amman, right? They were not to, to yeah. cross into the blessed realm. And, and I think for we can, we can sympathize with the later Numenorians who looked at this and said, well, why are you trying to hold this back from us? Why are you trying to hold this blessed life back from us? And, you know, there must be something like, you know, you, you, you've got something against us, right. Or you're using us or something like that. Right. And that's, you know, there, there's a suspicion that grows from that. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the defense of that from the perspective of Amon is that, well, it, this is not your destiny right? That, mm-hmm. that, that this is not really for you. And it would actually become uh, a bad thing for you pretty quickly, mm-hmm. right? If you were to come, if, if you were to try to come live here. Mm-hmm. All right. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I think there's some other things to be said about this band, given this religion and given um, some other things that we've just laid out about Numenor. All right. So the land of Numenor is shaped like a star and the mental Tarma is the focal point of its geography. The land of the star points to the heavens. All right. So this heavenly land, points to the heavens, not to the, not to the uh, West, but it points to the heavens. Mm-hmm. The symbology is to say, direct your attention to the heavens and not any earthly paradise. The Eldar may be of this world, but the destiny of the Atani is with Iluvatar, right? Mm. So the Eldar are tied to the world. That, so, and one of the things we're going to find out in the nature of Middle Earth, uh, when, we, when we spend some more time in that, is that elves their life, like they were immortal in the sense that they were tied to the lifespan of Arda, right. To, of the mm, world. Yeah, right. right. Um, w- whereas men had these short lives and what lay beyond that short life, they didn't know. Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so Numenor is like this first, uh, attempt of Iluvatar to begin the process of rescuing men and restoring them to their original destiny, right? right? They were, they've been under the slavery. They've been under the fear of the shadow of Melkor and of his works mm-hmm. for so long. And then this is his first, you know, kind of, this is the outpost of heaven, right? This is the outpost mm-hmm. of, of heaven for men. Um, that land says, direct your attention to the heavens and not any earthly paradise. Um, so it's a two-way street though. Okay. So here's the thing. They weren't just given this land to be a gift to them and just, ha- just be able to hang out and have a good time for the rest of history. Right. A true gift is never just about that because if it were, then it would just kind of rot within us. Right. It would just, it would just be something that caused us to become more self-focused. Right. Um, but a true gift is about helping us to achieve our, uh, a greater purpose that ultimately helps others. Right. That ultimately mm-hmm. enlightens and helps, uh, and is beneficial to others. Yeah. Um, Iluvatar meets with his people upon the mental Tarma to enlighten them, and the ban was not some cruel scheme to withhold paradise from them, but to turn their attention back to their brethren, shrouded as they were in darkness, bound to futility and despair. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, you know, just think of that scene where uh, Gandalf chastises Denethor, you know, when he's about to, you know, uh, immolate himself, mm-hmm. right? And his, and his, uh, and Faramir, right? Mm-hmm. And he's like, you're not one of these pagan kings of old, right? That just, you know, that, that was bound to despair and futility, right? You have a greater purpose. You're the mm-hmm. steward of Gondor, right? Mm-hmm. And this Gondor, of course, being, you know, a descendant culture from Numenor, right? right? Yeah. Um, stop acting like the way you're acting, right? Um, so it, it would seem that Numenor 
when they finally take to ships, that this is in fact part of their destiny, right? They, they don't take to the sea really and, and, and travel back to Middle Earth for several hundred years, okay? But when they do and they return to the East, initially they return not to conquer, but to get to know these people back here better mm -hmm. and, and, and maybe even to liberate to the knowledge of, of Iluvatar and their heavenly destiny. Yeah. Now, we don't see that called out specifically in this text or in a Kalabath, but I found something really interesting in um in one of the volumes of the history of middle earth right so there's a there's so much good stuff in here right and um and so this is from uh the drowning of anadune in volume nine um sauron defeated and and so what what it says is some sail back to the dark lands and this is tolkien kind of sketching sketching this stuff out right so he's thinking out loud some sail back to the dark lands meaning middle earth there they are greeted with awe, for they are very tall. They teach true religion, but are treated as gods, right? Mm. They teach true religion, but are treated as gods. This is speaking of Numenorians? Of the Numenorians, right? Okay. They sail back to the dark lands, and they teach true religion, but are treated as gods, okay? Hmm. And then Sauron comes into the picture uh, shortly thereafter. So we can see that this stuff was at least on Tolkien's mind as he developed, mm. uh, as he developed this uh, this story, this mythology of yeah. Numenor, right? Yeah. The story of the of what happened to that culture. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, I think when you get back to it, it really is like this key to understanding um, why Numenor was there in the first place. That Numenor was not just about a bunch of men sitting fat and happy because their dad had done some, had had been helpful to the elves, right? Um, Numenor was about a first outpost of a Luvatar for mm -hmm. for men to provide them with the perspective of like you know, to, to, to equip a certain group of men of, uh, of Atani to go and enlighten their brethren, like to tell them like, wait, don't be slaves to the darkness. Don't be slaves to the shadow, right? Don't be slaves to despair and futility, but turn your eyes to the heavens, turn your eyes to Iluvatar, the one. Talk right? about missionaries. Exactly. Yeah. Right. That they were a missionary people. Mm -hmm. Um, I just did a, an episode with, um, uh, I, I recorded an episode earlier this week on pints with Jack and David Bates and I were talking and I mentioned this idea and it was, and David, of course, is like, it's almost like there were to be a light to the nations. Right. And I was like, yeah. Right. Well, I we think about the star shape of the Island. Right. Yeah. I mean, stars provide light in the darkness. Stars mm -hmm. provide light. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Boom. That's a good one. Um, so, you know, it's like, how is this fundamentally religious? It's right there. Right we can see clearly where, why Tolkien is, like called this fundamentally religious. This was not a throwaway phase or mm -hmm. a phrase that he gave to somebody. Mm -hmm. This was something that he discerned as he was developing this mythology yeah. because he understand, he understood that we as human beings, we have this need to know what our end is, what our purpose in everything mm -hmm. is. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, religion comes from the Latin root, which means to bind, to place under obligation. The Edain were given Numenor not so they could sit back and take it easy, but so they could create a culture of men hallowed to Iluvatar and then spread the knowledge of Iluvatar and the, and the true destiny of men to their brethren still in bondage to the shadow. Mm. Even into the days of the War of the Ring, we can see Gondor still striving according to this great purpose, though with far less vigor and, and knowledge than Numenor in its prime, mm -hmm. right? It become kind of a distant memory, maybe just a little bit of a tradition for them. Mm -hmm. um, but they were still right. They were this outpost, right. Of, uh, of, of, of good, of goodness, mm -hmm. of potential goodness. Right. It's like would a say. lighthouse. Right. I think of lighthouses as being outposts, you know, to keep ships from being from, from getting too close to the shore or running aground or something like mm -hmm. that. So, you know, maybe they were meant to be else, you know, it's maybe an another lot analogy we could use. And, 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 and honestly, that's what makes the fall of Numenor so tragic, right. Mm -hmm. Is because they had this exalted purpose. Mm -hmm. but they fell away from it. They misunder like they misunderstood. Um, and, and, and they became corrupt too. They started using, uh, it, it says there, they, you know, back in that uh, passage I read from the history of middle earth, they went to teach true religion, but, but the people that they taught often regarded them as gods. Right. And so you can see how, um, unscrupulous men would use that to their advantage, right. To, to take advantage of people. Right. They would say, mm -hmm. Oh, they, they think we're gods. Maybe we should, Maybe we should take advantage of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, we should take tribute from them and, you know, and all these kind of things. And maybe we can even rule over them, right? And, uh, and take even more advantage of them, right? So it, 
and we see that throughout the history of Numenor that they trans they transform uh, from this culture that seems to want to um, be beneficial to those they meet to a culture that wants to dominate them, right? Mm-hmm. And they they almost become rivals with Sauron, right? Which is exactly what Sauron wants at the end. In the end, right? Yeah. He wants to he wants to spoil all that. Um, so fundamentally religious, yes, we can see that. Catholic, well, the three prayers of Numenor's religion follow the pattern of the Mass, the Catholic Church's most sacred liturgical action. And the whole idea of the Mass is that we we meet with God Himself, right? We meet with God Himself directly, right? And 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 mm. through the mediator of Jesus Christ, right? Through the mediator of Christ. Christ being the true man, Christ being the man that we are all part of, that we become part of when we uh, become baptized. Okay. Um, every mass begins with a collect that offers supplication to God, the father, right? Prayer of supplication, the prayer in the spring, the first prayer supplication, every mass reaches its climax when the priest offers all of creation to God and father in an act of praise, right? All glory and honor is yours forever and ever, right? The supreme act of praise in the middle of it. And every mass ends with great acts of thanksgiving, especially in the post communion prayer, Mm. right? So this is this great act of thanksgiving, uh, given, uh, given to God at the very end. All right. So we see, you know, a loosely mirror the, the flow of the mass and these three prayers. Okay. Um, so what about the Eagles? Um, you know, I'm not really sure what to do with that. I think it's interesting that they provide uh, these witnesses to, um, uh, to, the, to the act of worship there. But I think we could also make an analogy between the eagles and angels, right? Um, so one thing is that in the mass, like Catholic theology teaches that the angels are there worshiping witness with us, and they are witnesses to our worship, right? They're not actually able to worship in the same way that we do, but they still worship in their own way, right? So the the eagles there, we could perhaps say, are um, are the witnesses to our worship in the same way that the angels are the witnesses to the worship of the mass. That's really interesting. Yeah, one of my favorite parts of the mass during the, the uh, consecration is when they, uh, in certain Eucharistic prayers, they actually, they, the priest calls down angels, mm-hmm. right? He says, we, you know, ask the angels to carry the sacri- you know, sacrifice up to God the Father. Oh, my bad. You can see my hands. <laughs> um, so, you know, that almost, you can you think the eagles in that way, like the eagles are there to then take the prayers and you know, everything of the people back up to Lutar. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, I think it, I think it fits. It fits. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in all of this, I just see um we're we're getting closer to the heart of what Tolkien meant by this statement that the Lord of the Rings and and by extension, the the entire legendarium of Middle Earth was a fundamentally religious and Catholic thing. I think the mm-hmm. case can be made very strongly with Ainu Lindale, which I, you know, I kind of talk about elsewhere. Um and, and, and honestly, as I read through some of the stuff in the history of Middle Earth that we haven't even gotten to yet, it's, it's even clearer to me. And so we're going to be getting to some of that stuff in some future episodes, uh, probably pretty soon. But I, you know, my biggest hope for this Latron Prime show is that they don't, uh, they don't, they don't treat this religion of Numenor as a thing that's unimportant, right? Or, or that they do it wrong, right? Um, because I think there's a temptation to want to not make too much, not put too much emphasis on this. Mm-hmm. Well, it's such a personal and controversial thing, right? It, it is, but you're talking, but you're, but you're talking about something that Tolkien himself laid oh, out. Absolutely. About this, right? I'm just saying that probably it's. Well, the temptation, you know, that that's where the temptation may right, come the, from. Exactly. Uh, the yeah. temptation may come from to like, we're going to, we're going to make some yeah. people not want to watch this because they don't like religion or mm-hmm. something like that. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but again, like my, my challenge to people who would say, who would, who would, who that's their, their kind of working line. They just don't even want to talk about it. Is like, try to, try to take a step back and wonder and understand what religion is, is in the first place. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, religion is an effort to get to the, to the heart of meaning, to the heart of what is truly um, what each of us is truly here for. And so like key question, I'm going to, I'm going to, I think I said, I'm going to start trying to do some more like key reflective questions, you know, more often because I liked what Greta did a couple of episodes with the Calipay. So my key question for today is what is the meaning of your life and how do you discover meaning? How do you deal with the ultimate reality that your life will indeed one day come to an end, not to lay a bunch of darkness on you, but you all know it's true, right? We all know it's true. Mm -hmm. And I would even say with that question, Tolkien, 
knew that question well from very early on, right? Lost his father before he even knew him, lost his mother at a young age, um, and experienced World War I and saw plenty of death, okay? He was very aware of death, and death, the reality of death, lay at the very heart of everything he did in Middle Earth, right? In fact, I would go on, I would go so far as to say that like it's, it's an extended like just meditation on what the meaning of life is, right? And all of these things, right? And I think that's what so draws me to it. What so draws so many of us to it is this imaginative, incredible, incredibly beautiful work of art. And at the center of it all, it's like, what are we here for, mm-hmm. right? What purpose? does all of this mean? Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Not just in Middle Earth, but here mm-hmm. right now, yeah. because of course that Middle Earth all connects to our own story, right? It's all, it's all a fictional mythology that, that connects to our own story. And in the future of Middle Earth, so mythology lay the incarnation, which is also something that actually Tolkien talked about and, uh, and, 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 and said as much that the incarnation was, um, was actually something that a particular elf in the first age actually predicted, but we'll get to that another time. Oh, all right. Greta, cool. any yeah. more to say about this? No, I think, I think you, uh, I think you hit the nail on the head. Right on. Well, yeah, it's a wrap. this is one I was excited to talk about. So I hope you guys Clearly. enjoyed it. Yeah, it was good. Um, if you did drop on over to patreon.com slash Tolkien road and become a patron, give us a shout out that way. Shout out. All right. Let's hit some correspondence. Uh, first up going back a little bit, little ways, catching up on some older correspondence. Uh, we have Jedi mind trick on December 22nd of 2020. Let's see here. This is in response to, uh, my video Tolkien versus the Nazis. Jedi mind trick says this makes me love Tolkien even more. And I I'm Jewish. (laughs) I love it. That's that's, <laughs> that's awesome. That's a very rewarding comment to uh, yeah, to receive. So, For sure. uh, thank you, Jedi Mind Trick. Really nice to hear from you. All right. Next up is from Tim on January second of twenty twenty one. All right. Tim says hi, John and Greta. Thanks for the great podcast. Just finished listening to episode one ninety five, the future of Middle Earth. I think animation and graphic novels would be a great way forward i'd love to see some new animated versions of lord of the rings or the hobbit there's a great set of video games called the banner saga inspired by norse mythology and the animation and art style would fit middle earth perfectly you should check them out i reckon there would be a load of tolkien road listeners who would love them best wishes tim i did i took a look so i looked up this banner saga um and it looks i mean the artwork i saw looks really cool and i really love the the style it has the kind of that um that like 80s style of I, I would call it an 80s style of of, of uh, like fantasy animation mm. um almost, almost like it's like continuous but better than what we saw in like the hop the animated hobbit um you know, like kind of a continuation and improvement on that um i think this would be a great style for you know for some tolkienian adaptations okay. so um cool. yeah so y'all go over there check out bannersaga.com to know what tim is talking about thanks tim yeah Thank you. Next up is from Ross H on March 2nd. Ross said, um, long time listener, first time sending a message, but have you seen this? And so basically he linked to an article from, uh, that, that is an interview with Philip Pullman who wrote the, um, his dark material series. And I guess this is a, I guess in this art interview, Philip Pullman like criticizes Tolkien's female characters. Um, Ross goes on to say, what are your thoughts? I think women play a huge role more than people give them credit for. I would agree with that. Yeah. Uh, in every scene where a woman speaks in the books or movies, everyone listens and heeds their words. And when women do fight, they almost always prevail. I just love just mm-hmm. like when I hear this argument, the first thing I want to tell people is, is just go read Baron and Luthien before you talk to me about this. All right. Because literally... <laughs> I know it, it sounds like Baron is going to be the hero of that story, but Luthien is the hero of that story without a doubt. Right. Baron is a, is kind of a buffoon. All right. I mean, he's pretty, he's a pretty studly dude. Don't get me wrong. Right. But like he's a buffoon and he makes buffoonish decisions and it's Luthien who saves him. <laughs> right. It's Luthien and the dog that save him. Right. So, um, you know, anytime somebody was like, Oh, the female character, you know, talking about it's like, go read Baron and Luthien. Um, he says, I've almost caught up with all the podcasts of the current episodes, but I still got several episodes to go. Um, so 
Uh, he says, P.S. I've been listening on and off between Warhammer 40K audiobooks and Creepypasta. But one thing that has been nagging at me was how much grief you gave the name Tolkien uh, that, that Tolkien gave to Aura Druin or Mount Doom. I don't think it is that dumb or lame of a name. Doom is brought up a lot in Lord of the Rings and the Silmarillion, such as the Doom of Mondos when Feanor et al. left Valinor to chase Melkor. I think it is an apt name because the future of Middle-earth is intrinsically tied to what happens in the mountain, whether the ring is or is not destroyed. We've seen the Doom when Isildur and Elrond first tried to destroy it, and we even saw the Doom when Sauron was first forging the One Ring. Basically, too long didn't read. It is a fitting name for such an important place in Middle Earth. So, and that was his T- TLDR. That was not me saying TLDRing him. Um, <laughs> Good clarification. Ross, it's a great point. And, you know, whenever like we kind of joke about something like that, especially if it's something Tolkien himself said, it's, I feel like it's more of us joking at ourselves because like we're not smart enough. We're not as smart as Tolkien was. Right. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you, the other, the other thing like, Do- like Mount Doom that stands out to me is uh, Tuna. Right. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. oh, why did he name this? Uh, you know, why did he name this important mountain after a, um, you know, after a fish, a, a fish and, and like, you know, like a fish that is like canned seafood. Yeah. Right. Um, but he didn't. Right. He had a reason for giving it that name. And there is a deeper reason in all of this. So I think you I think your comment is a it's it's good and in, in recognizing that. Mm-hmm. So we really appreciate you saying that. And mm-hmm. You know, yeah, I mean, we try we want to have a little fun with it because for a lot of people, it does start, is it like he has all these amazing names and then it's like Mount Doom, right? It's like, hmm, couldn't you've come up with a better name than that? But he didn't. That was the name he chose, and I, and I, kind of always defer to his choice and say mm-hmm. he had good reasons for doing that. He's so, a genius, not us. Um, I want to say real quick too, going back to his original point about women in Lord of the Rings, there was a great quote a couple of uh, months ago from. The actress Emma Thompson, who is uh, uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with, she's a pretty well known and well respected uh, British actress. And 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 by the way, pretty uh, pretty like strong feminist from everything I've been able to gather. Um, and and she had this quote uh, that I thought was really good, where she said, uh, "Let me make sure I get her exact quote." All right, here she is. And I think she's reacting to a lot of the films about you know, like superhero films and that kind of thing where like, it just seems like every woman has to be uh, like, you know, as strong as the men. So basically what she says is um, now women have to be badass. If they're feminine in the way that they used to be and they're not badass, then they're not welcome. Also, they're not allowed to cry apparently anymore because we've just, we've just got to be like the men. Why are there no films about giving birth for crying out loud? Does anyone even know about that? No, no, it's all hidden. All our heroism is hidden because what we've done is we've just given women the same parts as men, and that's not the point. How do we turn into our own lives and make those stories heroic? Mm. And look, I'm not saying I'm not saying that you can't have uh, awesome women warriors. I just think that's an awesome quote, mm. right? And I think it's coming from somebody like Emma Thompson, who is, you know, a pretty avowed feminist. Um, there's something to think about there, mm-hmm. you know. Um, mm-hmm. And what is like, you know, what is um, uh, true, you know, like, like what are the, what are, what does feminine heroism look like? Right. Um, what has feminine heroism looked like in the past? Right. Mm -hmm. And is that really such a bad thing? Like Mm -hmm. so bad that we can't have those kind of characters anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think I have what it takes to give birth to a child. I'll be quite honest. Right. Uh, this one did three times. Right. And, um, and lots of women have done it way more than three times. And we know plenty of women that have done it way more than three times. <laughs> yeah. And there's something amazing and beautiful about that form of heroism, right? The everyday heroism. Um, and, and quite honestly, it's inspiring to me as well. Absolutely. So. And, um, you know, as, as an OB nurse, um, I, I heard one of, uh, I heard a labor nurse at work the other day say something to the effect of childbirth or giving birth to a child is, is the most dangerous point in a woman's life. Mm-hmm. And that really kind of made me stop and think, cause I mean, especially in light of heroism, right? What is heroism? Like it's coming up against something super dangerous, right. And being willing to go forward and ultimately conquering and prevailing. Right. You know? So, mm-hmm. um, I love that she, I mean, that is truly the, you know, obviously the most obvious thing that sets men apart from women is their ability to bring life into the world. Um, but I just love that she used that particular, you know, that particular, 
um, gift that's given to women because it's like, you know, it is, it is the most dangerous point in a, in a woman's life. Yeah. And, and I think it's, I think it's a shame that that is often not, um, like emphasized how great a power that truly is. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, that it's anyway, I, I, I'm not going to wax. We could get, uh, we could talk for hours about this probably. And, but there's, there is an interesting little thing that I wanted to mention in this article. This is not from it. This is the article that quotes Emma Thompson, but this is not the, um, this is not something she said, but, but it, this is interesting. Pregnancy and childbirth used to be so dangerous that most women back in, you know, in pre-modern times would then immediately write out their wills as soon as they found out they were pregnant. Right. Wow. Crazy. I mean, thanks to all the technology and advances in modern medicine, it's not nearly, you know, the risk as dangerous as, as it dangerous once was, it once was yeah. but there's still just so many things that could potentially go wrong. That's what makes it still so dangerous. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyway, Ross, great, mm -hmm. uh, great comments. Thank you so much. Great to hear from you. Absolutely. All right. Uh, next up is Jennifer from June 15th. Uh, so Jennifer says, uh, is this from June 15th? Hmm. Uh Oh, well, I think you're in July. Oh, I'm in July. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Let's go to June. June looks like July. Oops. We'll get it here. Okay. There we guys. go. Oldest question in the universe. The question that must never be answered turned out to be a trap for the doctor. So Jennifer was oh. giving us an education on Dr. Who uh, yes. a couple months ago. His own people, the Time Lords, were trying to come through a crack in the universe, and they wanted to make sure they were coming through the right one. So they had a truth field set up on a certain planet. Anyone within the truth field's range would not be able to lie or speak falsely. The doctor, however, refused to answer the question because he knew that if the Time Lords came through, another war between them and their enemies would break out. It was just one more thing that was added to the mystery of the character. But you were right, John, when you said that once the character's real name and identity is revealed, that would ruin it. Like finding out Inspector Morris's first name and realizing why he never uses it. Yeah. One of my favorite things to point out to with that of the a perpetual mystery is uh, the is the video just by Radiohead for their song, uh, for their song, just because you got to watch the video. But basically, it's um, you know this guy like lies down on the street and everybody's like, why are you lying down? What's the problem? And he's like, if I told you, then, you know, then you do the same thing. Right. And so you never find out what he actually, you know, what the reason actually is. But the ending of the video is really brilliant in that way. So. Uh, and if, of course, if they ever told you like what it was, then it would ruin it. Would ruin it yeah. Right? It would ruin It'd be lame. The genius of it. Yeah. Uh, but, but it, but it gets to this thing that there's like mysteries beyond that just, that just elude us. Right. There's always going to be mysteries that elude our minds. And there's something I think wonderful about that. Right. I think mm -hmm. that adds mm -hmm. like enjoyment to life. I totally so, agree. Cause yeah. we want to ponder those things. What are the, like, that's mm -hmm. what we're doing. And then all of this is like, what is this, what is this amazing middle earth thing? Like, what is it so amazing? And we just can't get to the root of it. Right. We're always trying mm -hmm. to, and, and, but we, you know, it's like, we got to keep pushing, right. Yep. It's a thing to keep pushing on keep talking about it. Um, and Jennifer also left a note, a couple more notes uh, that I want to mention. So one of them was on, let's see, uh, June 25th. Jennifer said, uh, this is so cool. So she sent a link. So apparently there is an, uh, a new illustrated edition of the Lord of the Rings to be released. So it's not like oh. a, it's not like a graphic novel, but it's uh, just a, a not really nice version of Lord of the Rings with a lot of Tolkien's drawings in it. So. Oh, we'll, that's cool. Yeah. We'll link to that. Um, something cool to add to your bookshelves and let's see here. And then we've got a, uh, a post from July or a note from July 12th on heroism, which I thought was really good. Hello, John and Greta. Here's something interesting. I just recently heard about Dietrich von Hildebrand and his heroism. Not only did he speak out against Hitler and the Nazi regime, he spoke out about truth and beauty, but most of all, he was a witness to the Christian faith and moral courage. As I listened to the story of this man, I realized that this moral courage is one of the main themes woven throughout the Lord of the Rings. Consider all the times a character answers a moral question or every time someone has an important choice to make. And also don't forget the hobbits and why they are the heroes, especially Frodo and Samwise. And then she gives a link uh, about mm. Dietrich von Hildebrand. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, one of the most beautiful things about Lord of the Rings is in, in all the stories in the Middle Earth Legendarium is the heroism, right? Yeah. And, the, and the hobbits stand out because of their smallness and the way they, they just, they do the right thing and persevere and do the right thing, right? Even to, even to the bitter end. So, yeah, yeah. really beautiful. Um, good stuff. Thank you, Jennifer. 
Uh, next one is from Worty on uh, July 9th. Worty says, just thought I would make my first post about something that has intrigued me for a long... Oh, actually, I'm going to hold off on that one. We had a, one from the 9th that I wanted to get. That was from the 8th. Hmm. Um, uh, yeah, Worty's left us quite a few things. I think that may be the... the uh, the joke about Wordy's name is he's Wordy. Um, <laughs> I was wondering where that came from. Okay. We got a lot, we got a lot of correspondence from him. We're not going to catch up on it all today, but uh, we'll get to a lot of it another day. But anyway, uh, on a different note, recently started listening to the Hobbit audiobook with my dad. He is not a reader by any stretch of the word, and it is incredibly exciting to see him getting pulled into Middle Earth and losing himself in the adventure. I laughed out loud when we came upon the banished elves of Rivendell and their overmerry tongues, and he just gave me a strange look. Thought you guys might find that a little comedic, but in all honesty, I don't absolutely hate the rendition of the song in this version I'm listening to. If you would like to listen to this version, it is the audiobook available on Spotify. The song starts at 620 chapter three. The version I'm listening to is by an artist named An Unexpected Journey. Thanks again for all you guys do, and I will end here. Otherwise, I will type and type until my thumbs fall off or burst into flame, or as Bilbo might say, struck by lightning, struck by lightning. <laughs> um yeah, well, I check out the audiobook of The Hobbit on Spotify. I didn't realize there was one available to, spot, to Spotify listeners. Um, and this uh, band, An Unexpected Journey, I'll have to give them a give them a listen. But yeah, that would be funny to watch a person's reaction, like listening to The Hobbit, and then all of a sudden you're like, tra la 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 li. Yeah, the tra la 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 li. Mm -hmm. yeah. How can we forget? Right. They're pretty memorable. All right. Mickey on uh, August 18th. Mickey had this to allow. You know, it's a really good thing that you took over correspondence from me because there's no way I could keep up with all this. It's a lot. Yeah. It's a great. I love it. I love it. I love that we have, this, uh, you know, so many listeners that write to us for sure. So Mickey says, hello, I've only been listening for about six months now. And regretfully, I've not listened to every episode, which I wish I had. I have searched through. Uh, it's all right. We'll give you a few more days to get yeah, caught up, Mickey. Just a few, though. Uh, I have searched through a few of my favorite chapters and stories with the search bar, but haven't found what I've been searching for uh, you guys to talk through. To start, I absolutely adore both of your opinions and your analysis of the text. I've honestly started reading along to the podcast, and I've never really liked podcasts. Hmm. Awesome. My love for Tolkien and his works have always been close to my soul, and it, it's made me euphoric to hear how much other humans possess the depths in which I can also relate to. Um, process the depths in which I can also relate to. I read the article... I um, was wondering if you've touched on the concept of how Sam was actually the main character of Lord of the Rings. I read an article or two, and I'll let you guys look it up on your own, because I suppose I'd be a biased opinion on the matter, but I've definitely been enchanted reading about the hero's journey and how a character develops and how he doesn't even consider himself to be on said journey. And uh, in your cast, Stairs of Kirith Ungol, it's retold how Sam is only considered as Frodo's servant in the Silmarillion, and yet is offered up as Samwise the Stout-Hearted in the Two Towers by Frodo himself. And the story begins, yes, with tales of Bilbo and his favorite cousin, but ends up with talk from the old gaffer and his son and how he listens to the tales of Baggins and how he went on an adventure without thought, but with loyalty to what he believed to be real and whether tale or a friendship he persevered. And at the end, it's Sam's perspective. Evening meal was ready and he was expected. Rose drew him in, set him in, in his chair and put little Eleanor in his lap. Well, I'm back. That's the end. Starts with his intro, ends with his point of view. What he knew and what he knows. Just like to know your thoughts, whether an email or email back or whatever, I've always been fond of the theory. Mm -hmm. Sorry if it's jumbled. Mickey from Colorado. Well, thanks for listening, Mickey. Mm -hmm. It's great to hear from you. Yeah. Um, we have talked about this at different times. I don't think we've ever done like a, a, specific, a specific episode on it. But I think there's a, a very strong case to be made that uh, Sam is the, is the protagonist. Whether... Tolkien, I don't know that Tolkien ever called that out, but I don't think he would have pushed back very hard against that idea. Um, one thing we do know is that Sam is very much based on sort of um, the the Tommy soldiers, right, from World War One that mm -hmm. Tolkien would have known that he would have uh, really been in command over in a lot of cases as an officer. Uh, but, you know, just kind of the the soldiers in the trenches, the, the basic foot soldier, um, who were just these, you know, these these like people from the countryside and the working class in, um, in, in Britain at that time. And here they were like putting their lives on the line for a cause that, you know, they're like, what's this cause. Right. Yeah. Um, 
and and doing so very bravely. And we know that Tolkien had an immense amount of admiration for for so many of those men, right? And that and that something of he put something of those men into Sam's character, right? Um, and uh, and and I think you make you you highlight some of the things that show that like this, the development of Sam over the course of this story, right? That he was. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that he began in a certain place and became this great figure over the course of it. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know that it necessarily takes away from Frodo being one of the chief protagonists as well, right? Uh, ultimately, it seems like it's their French, it's almost like their friendship that's the protagonist, right? right? You know, the, between the two of them, right? Because right. one's not the same without the other. I mean, you need to have them both together. Right. And, and you know, there's this idea of like Tolkien fighting in the war. We know his friendships with others. Like, I, I don't know that that idea kind of pops into my head now that it's not just about one character or the other. Mm-hmm. It's about, it's about their friendship. It's about their relationship. And I will even say that as a Christian, there's like the, the Trinitarian idea in part of that, right. Mm-hmm. That, that God is not just a single being and a single person, but that he is a being of three persons in a, in perfect communion with one another in perfect friendship mm-hmm. in perfect communion with one another, right. Perfect fellowship. So I love the idea and I think mm-hmm. it may even go a step further and be that, yeah. you know, it's, it's about, it's about the friendships. It's about them together. Right. Yeah. It's, it's about, it's about their communion. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and the thing that they share in their growth together. And I think that's true of all of us, right. There's no, Absolutely. there's no single human being that this human story is about. It's about all of us. Right. On this journey. Exactly. Is that, right. And what is the mark of a you know, true friend is that they bring out the best in you. Right. Yeah. And you can definitely make the argument that Frodo and Sam bring out the best in each other for sure. Absolutely. Even despite the the weight of the ring. Right on. Great stuff. Yeah. For sure. Mickey, thank you so much. Yeah. Great, great question. Mm-hmm. Very good. All right. A uh, couple more. Uh, one from uh, Carl, Carl Hostetter on uh, hey. latest episode 253. So, um, Carl, oh, uh, we'll get to that one in just a second. A lot of there responses on our latest one, yeah. Oh, uh, I got these all out of order. All right. <laughs> I'm just going to pull up the video here so I can go straight to that. Because it, it was like a two-part comment from, from Carl. Do, 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 yep. do, do. All right. I'm almost there, guys. I'm almost there. Here we go. All right. So, Carl said Sindarin Udun is cognate with Quenya Utumno. Tolkien is in one place translate, translates it as deep pit. My own hunch is that it is modeled on Greek um, abusos, bottomless, unfathomable, boundless, whence English abyss. I also suspect influence from Welsh uh, an, anun, Ananun, the name in the Magbenen of the underworld and its ruler. Per Wikipedia, Middle Welsh sources suggest that the term was recognized as meaning very deep in medieval times. The appearance of a form uh, uh, atumnus, antumnos, on an ancient Gaulish curse tablet, which means an other, other tumnos world, however, suggests the original term may have been andedubnos, a common gallo Britonic word that literally meant underworld. So Carl dropping serious uh, Tolkienian language bombs, which I would expect mm-hmm. from Carl because of uh, he he knows what he's talking about with all that. Uh, but this, of course, gets back to that comment that we dealt with last time on the flame of Udun, right? So when uh, Gandalf refers to the Balrog as the uh, flame of Udun, right? So it's it so it 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 likely means the flame of like the abyss, right? Mm-hmm. So that's 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 where all this coming from. So Carl is is helping us out. He's throwing us a lifeline with understanding what the flame of a dune means. So uh, I can't remember the name of the person who dropped us that comment originally, but check out Carl's comment here. Be very helpful for you. And this was in response to a video or no, this was just a comment that somebody had left us that we dealt with last time Oh, on the last episode as part of our correspondence. Oh, okay. yeah. So, so the original gotcha. was talking about what, what Gandalf means by flame. I think it was going all the way back to like, uh, uh uh, the second episode when we you know of the podcast that's right so be that's right back. it's all coming back to me now so, yeah thank you carl yes, thank, thank you for you. dropping mm-hmm. uh, uh very helpful knowledge bombs knowledge bombs or knowledge balloons as maryland librarian yes. like to call them yes um all right and then the last comment for today is from tom tom 
Tom M. All right. He left us quite a few comments. Yeah, I want to go to, I'm going to go straight to the video again for this one. All right. Tom says, I enjoyed listening early in the day. So blood sugar is good. <laughs> Maps for me are, an, are interesting to look at, but I don't refer to them while reading. They don't uh, stay clearly in my mind and I hate to disturb the narrative to refer to them. I would find them useful if they were inserted at the beginning of a chapter where needed. Mm -hmm. As far as a frame narrative, I agree. I would nominate Sam as the narrator as he and his descendants were the keepers of the Red Book of Westmarch. I know there were copies elsewhere also. Mm -hmm. Thanks for blessing my morning. Thanks for awesome. an awesome comment, Tom. Tom and I, were like on the same page when it comes to maps. Right on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I like the idea of having a map like at the beginning of each chapter, maybe different sections. And that's how mm -hmm. I responded to him. You know, it contextualizes that map a little more. Yeah. And I think that'd be really helpful, actually. It's almost like maybe each chapter needs like an introduction with a couple of different like references in it or yeah. each, you know, maybe different sections need that. Uh, and Tom later said, also, I enjoy the correspondence. The quality of the comments you receive are evidence of the high quality of your podcast. The best honey attracts the best bees. Oh, uh, that's cool. Yeah, and he said, "Well, I should have said the best honey reveals the best bees. Bees make honey. Cleverness killed the cat." <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't even pick I, up on that. I, I was with you, Tom. I was with you. We knew exactly where you're coming from. Um, I have to say, like, yeah, I, I really enjoyed uh, doing more on YouTube and and having the direct comments right there in there. So I encourage everybody again, like, uh, it's it's really nice to be able to just respond quickly to things and um and see that kind of correspondence going on and have a record of it for the mm -hmm. for the world to see not the only way you can contact us and i understand everybody might want to do not might not want to do that but so far i'm really enjoying uh, the process on youtube so awesome all right yeah well we'd love to hear from each and every one of you tolkien road podcast at gmail.com tolkien road.com facebook twitter youtube etc all right all the things all the things mm -hmm. So that's all for this episode. Thank you to our amazing patrons, especially the following. Andrew T. John R. Ms. Anonymous. Caitlin of T with Tolkien. Shannon S. Brian O. Emilio P. Zeke F. James A. James L. Chris L. Chuck F. Ozzy V. Ish of the Hammer. Teresa C. David of Pints with Jack. Jonathan D. Eric S. Joey S. Eric B. Johanna T. Mike M. Robert H. Paul D. Julia. And we're T. As well as those celebrating their patron anniversary in August, Tom M, Jonathan L, Henry B, Austin B, Caitlin H. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Well, uh, thank you for watching, and mm -hmm. we will talk at you next time. Bye, y'all. Bye, bye. <laughs>